Hey, folks, I'm the man with the pinky ring in a New York thing. Forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood, and you're watching the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Now, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Tell all your friends about it. Leave your comments below. Let's have a conversation on this episode. Well, today, folks, I've been promising my viewers that I was going to bring you 80s groups, big names from the 80s, which is my generation. I was a teenager, okay? I turned 13 in 1981, but don't tell nobody, hey, you didn't hear that from me. One of the biggest groups of the later part of the 1980s was the Escape Club, who had a number one U.S. hit with Wild Wild West. I wish I could sing, forget about it, but they could and they can. And my guest today that I welcome from all the way across the pond, forget about it, is the lead singer, the one, the only, Trevor Steele. All right. Well, first of all, I want to welcome you all the way in, you're in England, you're six hours ahead of me. So I always say, uh, Trevor, when I have a guest that's ahead of me in time, can you give me the lottery numbers over <laughs> here so I can play them tonight since you should know them in advance? I wish <laughs> I could 50-50. Okay, that's, that's a deal, man. It's a deal. <laughs> well, hey, I appreciate you coming on today. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. I, I love the group. I did, Thank I did you. a lot of research on you and a lot of stuff to talk about. But before we get into the, uh, the Q&A, let me ask you, how are you dealing with COVID over there? Whoa. Um, well, I'm in London um, and it's pretty heavy over here. I think it's been pretty badly mismanaged. Um, I, I saw you spoke to Nick from Wang Chung, by the way, who's a good mate of mine. And I said, I saw that he said exactly the same thing. We agree on that. It's not been managed very well. Um, me and my wife are locked up in this apartment and we've stayed here pretty much all the time. Um, yeah, it's, it's not easy, but, but we're doing the right thing. We're just staying in and looking after ourselves, getting our food delivered and uh, popping out occasionally. But it's been quite a long sentence, I've got to say, you know. Okay. All right. What I would like to do is let's go back to the beginning and then <laughs> right, we'll work okay. forward from there. So it looks like you were born in Hampstead. Is that correct? Yes, I, I was born in Hampstead, actually, and that, which is a suburb of London. It's quite a posh suburb, by the way, actually, but the bit I was born in wasn't. <laughs> but, <Okay. laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, that, that's where I was born all those years ago. Yeah. Okay. What was it like for you? Grow now, did you did you move to Australia? Did you or did you grow up there in the sixties and the seventies? No, no, I, I I'm, I'm UK. I'm I'm Londoner by birth. I, okay. I moved to Australia. Um, okay, only, years later. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I grew up. Um, I didn't actually grow up in London. My parents decided to move to to the um, to the suburbs before I was old enough to moan about it. So we ended up um, in a place called Essex, which is actually where I met John. So it's probably serendipitous to do that. Um, yeah. So so I moved to Essex and I grew up there. My school days were spent um, in Essex, and I spent pretty much every waking hour trying to get back to London. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, were your parents musical? No, not at all. No, they weren't. No, my my dad's mum, my grandmother was a pianist. So so it went back another generation. She she was a piano player. That, but that's about it really. Yeah. Okay. So early on, uh at what point in your life early on did you know that you wanted to get into music? Well, I wanted to well, I've got an early, really early memory of when I was in, in junior school. I don't know what you'd call that now, like really, really early, really young. I remember seeing kids taking up trumpet and clarinet and stuff and being allowed to stay in to practice during break periods. And I remember walking past them and going, hmm, hey, you know what? I think if I should take up an instrument, then I wouldn't have to go out and play in the rain, you know. <laughs> but I never actually got around to doing that. Um, I didn't actually, I, I wanted to be in a band. That was the thing. And I, and I wanted to be in a band after helping out actually the guy who's playing drums for us now red was was a was a friend and i met him um he was a drummer in a band with john who, who you're going to interview john from the escape club as well those guys were playing way before i did and i used to kind of roadie for them and turn up for them and just sort of watch them rehearse in the school and all that stuff and i used to watch it and go yeah i really want to do that so red very kindly started to teach me how to play guitar and um and and it went on from there and as soon as i picked a guitar up and started playing it i knew that's what i wanted to do okay 
who were your early musical influences? Really early, really, really early, um, because I was learning guitar. It was Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton, because most guitarists would say the same thing. But really, as a writer and as a performer and everything, David Bowie and David Byrne were my two biggest influences, I think. Okay. You know, I got to ask you, uh, I you mentioned uh, Nick Feldman from Wayne Chung, and I interviewed Jack Hughes as well. Yeah. Everybody talks about Bowie. I interviewed um, Fee Wable from The Tubes, and everybody mentions Bowie. Um, do you have a Bowie story? Did you, did you ever meet him? Oh, God, no, I wish I had. Uh, it's one of, yeah, you, you know, when you get to our position, you do get to meet a lot of famous people. Um, and I always wanted to meet Bowie, but I never did. And I wish I had. Um, okay. yeah. <laughs> I think okay. he was holding the fabric of society together because after he died, everything went to shit. It sure <laughs> That's did. what it feels like. It, it, does, it, really, it, does. Did. it, did. it really does. It's mad. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, it's, and it, it was, it, it's crazy too, because if you laugh, if you look at one of the, like the last pictures of David, he was coming out of like a building, at least that's the last picture I saw, neat and, you know, just immaculate in a suit. He had, he looked thin, but he was always thin. He was always thin. Yeah, yeah, and thin white You yeah. know, they, they <laughs> uh, yeah, they, right, right. But they kind of like kept it quiet, you know, his, his wife and the family. And I, I was, I was shocked. I'm sure insiders probably knew, but. What a, what an influence, and, and so many artists bring up Bowie, and you brought up Jimi Hendrix as well. Yeah. It was Jack loved Jimi Hendrix. It, if you would, as a, because as a, you do play guitar, what was it as a musician, not the obvious maybe, that you liked about Jimi? Oh, well, he could play guitar like I knew I never could for a start. Okay. <laughs> that was the main thing, and I just loved the way he performed. I mean, he just made something special it was more than just playing guitar it was it was a whole new art form and to me as i was a kid when when i saw hendrix I, I never saw him but you know when i actually experienced it and i remember the first time hearing a friend of mine played it and you know played the record and just said you've got to check this guy out. and i was like whoa what is that what's that noise is that a guitar you know um so as a musician you know i could i'm not a very good guitarist i'm more of a songwriter and a singer really mm -hmm. um, but yeah but I learned a few licks. <laughs> okay. so, did, so did you ever off camera light your guitar on fire and make it go like <laughs> No, I never did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like in the early 80s, you were in a band called Mad Shadows. Oh, yeah, I was. That's right. You've done your research. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Talk about um, that. Well, it was, it was John, John and me. Um, who else? Um, yeah, right at the beginning, it was John and me and a guy called Ian Kerno who played with Talk Talk after he left us. He was mm -hmm. a good, good friend of ours, and I'll, I'll come on to him later. But he was an amazing keyboard player. Um, and it was during the New Romantic period. So it was just when Ultravox and Duran and all those guys were breaking. And we thought, well, let's get on, let's get on the bus and form a New Romantic band. And that was our Mad Shadows. Um, and it was really good fun. We got a small following and it was very synth based pop, really, I suppose, like all the, all the neuromantic stuff was. Um, but it was held up by Ian's genius because Ian is a phenomenal cable player. All those wonderful noises that come out of Talk Talk was pretty much Ian. Um, and he left to join Talk Talk. And when he left, we kind of started playing. We had a residency at a pub called The Greyhound. Um, and we started playing there and, and very slowly our audience disappeared because the songs weren't good enough to hold up by themselves. Okay. <laughs> so he did us a favour because really by leaving, he, John and I looked at each other and went, mm, yeah, we better start learning how to write songs, you know. <laughs> That's okay. how it worked. Okay. Yeah. It, you, interesting you mentioned Talk Talk. Um, I, I was looking at different groups and I, I remember the, their video and the song was huge when I was a kid. Um, I didn't realize that the lead singer, I forget his name, that, that he had passed away. Yeah, Mark Hollis. Yeah, he died, I think it was last year, maybe the yeah, year before. Yeah, because I was, was going to reach out to him, and I didn't, I didn't know until I started uh, looking on Google, doing a search yeah. of the band, that he had passed away. Yeah, but he was, I mean, if you get into his albums and get into their albums, there's some absolute genius there. An album called The Color of Spring is in my top five albums. It's just beautiful. It's just so good. He was a torture genius, Mark, yeah. from everything everyone tells me. I mean, yeah. you know, but that's, some people are like that, you know, yeah. Okay. It looks like around 85, you signed with EMI. Is that about right? 
yeah we signed with EMI well in the and during the time from Mad Shadows through to signing to EMI Johnny Christo joined the band Milan Zekovica our original drummer both joined the band and we became the Escape Club and we gigged around for quite some time before we got a deal um, but that's what you did in those days you know you just had to go and play the circuit so we you know we learned our chops over the over the years I think it took about I can't remember how many years three or four years before we even got a sniff of a of anything like a deal but by that time we were filling out famous cup club in London called the Marquee um I don't know if you've heard of that over there but it was it was a big club you know Hendrix had played there and Bowie had played there and all those people and we were filling it out and um had a good London following and um yeah we got the deal and made our first album on EMI okay um Everybody asks you this question, but I got to ask you because it's, the viewers are going to want to know. And I've, I know what the answer is because I've, I've seen you I've been asked it before. But the Escape Club, you kind of said it's kind of dated. I saw you in one interview. So, well, it's kind of dated now. But how did you come up with the Escape Club as a name? It, well, I've said this honestly recently. I never used to say this, but honestly, it was the, first, it was the only name we could come up with that we didn't all threatened to fight each other over it's the only one we all liked so you sit there all you know you like most young bands you sit there for nights and nights and nights it's one of the hardest things to do is to come up for your name and um i mean these days you have to try and get one with a dot com you can put after it as well but in those days it just had to be something that we all agreed on we made up stories afterwards about how we got the name and everything most bands do that the truth is we just came up with it i don't know where it came from okay no idea okay <laughs> Uh, in 88, you released your second album, which Wild Wild West, on, it was on Atlantic Records? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the title track, Smash It, goes to number one. I mean, yeah. I remember I was in the Navy station in Pensacola, Florida. I was all of 20 years old then. And, right. And, and full of, what do they say, piss and vinegar. <laughs> in the clubs. And then every, every other, like third, fourth song, they'd replay the song because... All the young women wanted to dance to that song. So it was very, very popular all the way in Pensacola, Florida. Listening to it now and, and watch, I, mean, I remember the video, the video was very artistic and I, I remember it like it was yesterday. But what's interesting in, in playing it now is that I love how you actually fuse together uh, horns, reggae. I mean, I, I, of course I heard it back then, but I didn't take it in as I do now, much older. You did a lot of stuff in that song, which was really, really cool to me now listening to it and playing it. Um, going into the studio, what was it like recording that? Uh, and what was it like uh, laying that album down? Well, the album, well, we had Chris Kimsey produced us, who's a really good producer, he used to produce the Stones. Um, he spent a lot of time with us in the studio i mean we can't do that these days either really we spent a lot of time just sort of jamming in there and getting ideas um wild wild west was originally a two and a half to three minute pop song you know um and what we did was we extended it because in those days obviously 12 inches were the thing so instead of doing it to do an edit we actually played a whole 12 inch all the way through so it turned into about five and a half six minutes and that turned out to be the single because it was so good. <laughs> All the little bits that we used, we just thought, we can't edit this, you know. We edited it a couple of bits out, but it ended up being a really long single. Um, in, in, in the pop stations in America, sometimes we had, to, we had to do an edit that took it down to, I think, just over four, which was quite long for them, even then for them. So things like the, the toasting wrap in there was just going to be for the 12 inch, um, but we kept it in there. Um, and like you say, well spotted, like the reggae, there's sort of reggae influences in there because Johnny, our bass player, big into reggae, he always was, you know, so there's a reggae influence through the whole band. And, and really also, I think, back in the day, it's hard to think back sometimes, but we, we wanted to do a dance rock hybrid. And, and there weren't many people doing it then. I mean, obviously In Excess did it around about the same time as us, but we were kind of getting a bit tired of just, everything was very guitar based. Um, and, and our first album was, and I love that first album, but it was still very sort of, we used to call it U3. There's so many U3s out there. We didn't want to be another one. We wanted to be something different. So it was quite experimental in the studio for the Wild West album. We, we took in influences. We, we all liked um, T-Rex and Mark Bolan. We all liked reggae. 
we like things like Run DMC and stuff like that that was out at the time. So we tried to mash all that together and put a rock feel on it and just see what we came up with, which is, it turned out pretty well. We were quite pleased with it. It's a classic. It still holds up. <laughs> all these years later, 32 years, took probably 33 years maybe when you record it, but 32 when it hit, it still holds up. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a fantastic job. I've been playing that on loop two over and over and over again <laughs> while I do in the research. I love it. Actually, Debbie's been upstairs dancing to the dog one thing, singing it. Because I'll, I'll play I say, you remember this song? And she's, as soon as she hears the open, she's like, yeah, I remember that song. She sings the rest of the song. Yeah. Um, I noticed we share something in common from your video in Wild Wild West and in other videos too. You love these leather jackets that are really, really cool. Yeah. I got to ask you, all these years later, Trevor, do you still have any of these cool leather jackets? I do, yeah. It's funny, I was talking about them only today. I've got, I've got, no, I've got three. I've got three of them. Each One from the Shake for the Shake video, the Wild Wild West video, and I've got one from the Call It Poison video. So I've got those three jackets that I wore. I should give them away in a competition or something, I guess, <laughs> oh, at some point, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. entering that competition. <laughs> <laughs> those jackets are freaking cool, man. I was like, man, yeah. those jackets are really, really cool. <laughs> um, I noticed uh, playing Wild Wild West and uh, Shake the Sheik. In Wild Wild West, you got a thing where you mentioned safe sex. And yeah. uh, Shake the Sheik, you have political overtones in it. So I wanted to ask you, and, and you wrote you wrote both of those songs or co-wrote both of those songs? Yeah, right? I, I write all the lyrics. Okay, you wrote all the lyrics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you had messages within a song. So obviously I you're, you, I don't know if you're like way out there, but you obviously have political and uh, social views. Cause yes. you put it in your music. Yeah. Um, where are you today with those political <laughs> and social views? In the post-truth era, I don't yes. know. I, I, I think as you get older, Brad, I don't know, it's, I, I was very, I mean, look, when, when you go to Wild West, it give me safe sex. Um, Ronnie's got a new gun, was Ronnie Reagan. Nowadays, when we do live gigs, I, I do Donnie. And I used to do Georgie when it was George. But I just do it because why not do the current president? Because that's right. what it was about, about living in the Western world, really. Shape of the Shake was about oil money. That hasn't changed. Nope. Um, I probably wouldn't write those lyrics now because I'm not an angry young man anymore. I'm an angry old man, but in a different way. If you see what I mean, okay. and I'm a, I'm a little bit more patient with people's views, but I do believe I look put it like this. I love the internet. I love the technology. The fact you and I are talking to each other now is marvelous. It's wonderful. But I think that I could make up a story that the whole of the world's run by a hundred monkeys living. In, in the Pacific on an island somewhere. I could put it out there and I reckon I could get at least a hundred people coming back and you know what? I've always thought that it must, it's the monkeys, man. It's the monkeys, you're right. And that's what people are doing now. You can make up any crap and people will believe it. And, and it's pretty worrying, especially when you've got disease like COVID out there. There's people thinking it's a hoax. I mean, I know two people who nearly died from it. It's not a hoax, no. you know. It's so, I'm a little bit confused with the world at the moment. I think we all are. Mm -hmm. And yes, I have my political views, which probably wouldn't be hard to guess, but I try not to push them on people now, but especially look, we, we toured last, last year, we toured around, around America and I could sense there how divided the audience were. And, and really it's like Biden's now saying it's time to heal, you know, so rather than criticize and say why can't we just all agree on something and let's move forward is, right. is my thoughts on it really otherwise you'll get me going and i can easily oh, do no, that as no. well it's, you know and i don't want to pull you in politics but i yeah if you watch me with nick if you watch the interview with nick yeah yeah absolutely yeah what i appreciate is you use your platform okay yeah you don't have to because you're gonna like you just said you turned america it's divided i'm sure you heard how i feel about trump i'm not going to ask you about all the trump stuff i despise him and I'm yeah, well, ask most musicians, man, right. they're going to say the yeah, same thing. Well, because, yeah, you have because most musicians have compassion. Yeah, you know true. that music yeah. brings people together, whether you're yeah. black or white, straight or gay. Music transcends all and it brings it together. But um, like you said, the, the country is divided and we need to, to unite. But I commend you. What I also want to say with that question is I commend you because even back then when you were much younger, you used your platform. You didn't have to because... You, when you do that, you might, especially today, you run into that shut up and just sing. 
you know, but the thing is, <laughs> it's right. so true. But, but yeah. the thing is, you're still a human being. You still have a family. You still, humanity is bigger than all of us, like Nick and I talked about. So I commend you that you used your platform way back when, even if you're, you're not as outspoken maybe as you used to be or, or whatever. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that to be a fact, but I, I commend you for it. Thanks, Nick. I mean, look, Brad, honestly, I... I, I I did it on purpose at the time. It was it was why it's one of the reasons I got up on the stage. You know, I didn't get up on the stage to be adored and you know do all that sort of stuff. I went up there because I I felt I had a message, you know, and I still do, and we we do as a band. Um, <laughs> I remember when <laughs> I remember being told off by Atlantic Records when I think it was Doug Morris actually said, you know, guys, you got to write a love song. I'm sick of all this because we never did. I always tried to avoid writing love songs, even though there were girls in the in the songs. We always tried and twisted it, you know. So shape for the shape, Wild West. They always had a little twist on them, you know. Um, he was right, probably. Okay. <laughs> well, in doing research, I want to come to something. I always call them chestnuts because they they jump out at me and they really touch me. So yeah. I didn't know about. Uh, the song I'll Be There, which was recorded on your third album, Dollars and Sex. Yep, that's right. In yeah. 1991, which went to number eight track. Well, Wild Wild West was my favorite, and I still adore it and love it, but I'll Be There is my number one now. I just absolutely love yeah. the song. <laughs> and I want to ask you about that song, but I want to read some of the lyrics for the viewers if you're not aware of this song, because it has a, it has a part in it that I want to talk to you about because it really, really touched me. And it goes, and I'm not going to sing because I'm no freaking singer, <laughs> but I'll read them. Don't be afraid, oh my love, I'll be watching you from above and I'll give all the world tonight to be with you. Because I'm on your side and I still care, I may have died, but I've gone nowhere. Just think of me and I'll be there. Trevor, that, that is, that's fantastic. I mean, it touched me to my soul. A, a beautiful lyric, beautiful song. Talk about the, the song, but what is that about if you can share that? Well, the story is, and it's the truth, this one. It's not just a story. A, a friend of ours' wife died, um, and it kind of touched us all. It, it reached us at a time when we were feeling a bit vulnerable doing the third album, and, and his wife died, and we were all touched by it. And we came up with these chords and the melody and, and I, the guys went off to go and have a, a Mexican, I remember. Um, and, and they said, I'll just stay here and I'll, and I'll have a go at the lyrics. And for some reason, I was just inspired to write the song as if I was his wife's ghost singing to him. And then I started thinking about my girl at the time and, you know, just thinking about what, what would you do if, and I think the movie Ghost had been out by then. So I was trying to imagine what it would be like. So I wrote it from the perspective of being a ghost, singing to your loved ones. Okay. Um, I think I inadvertently wrote my own funeral song, which is not good. <laughs> my wife can't even listen to it. So yeah, it's, it does, it touches me even now. There is something special happened as I wrote those lyrics. I know that I can say that it actually did. And they came from somewhere. Well, and, I'm, um, I'm yeah. telling you, like I said, I didn't know about it. I watched the video. I could tell that you felt it. I mean, I know that I know they they direct you and look like this. Look <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. You, were, you you were channeling it. I mean, yeah. And when I yeah. when I and I actually, after I heard it for the first time, I actually went to Google to see the lyrics because I I heard it, but I was you know when you watch the video, you don't always hear the lyrics. So because I'm focusing on what's going on, mm -hmm. because the video is incredible too with them underwater. And it That's was right. a very, very, very visual video, video, but I wanted to hear the lyrics. And when I went back and I, I cut and pasted the lyrics into my notes, I was like, wow, that, that, I knew there was a story behind it. I mean, bravo. I mean, that's just a Thank beautiful, you. beautiful uh, piece of work. The lyrics just touched me. And it, it, could, it really, I'm glad that you told a story, but it's a, it could be applicable to really anybody because we talk about these things when we lose somebody. You do absolutely, and I and I sung it to my mum before she died, which is awful, but you have to do it. Um, and the funny thing is that the the word, those words, okay, so you've got the lyrics. There's one line: "I may have died, but I've gone nowhere." We had so many discussions about that in the studio because it's a really hard hitting line, and and the producer at the time was trying to, was saying to me, "You know, well, if you change that, it could be a real big hit and everything." And I and I stuck to my guns. I'm pleased I did say no because that is what the song's about. You take that out, it will just be left. It'll just be 
So you need that linchpin, you need that line in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm really pleased we kept it in there now. It makes it a bit of a downer as a song, mate. It's not a party song, that's for sure. <laughs> but but yeah. it touches people. It, it and when we went on, yeah, and, and it does. And, and when we went on tour last year, I had people coming up to me in tears, just saying, wow, you know, that meant so much to me. And also, interestingly, with that song, because we've had, we got Wild West and I'll Be There, our two biggest hits, I guess. Mm -hmm very rare for people to put two and two together so we go up and we you know we're going up on stage and we're playing we're on one of those greatest hits packages so we we go up for our 20 minutes and, and they're waiting for wild wild west and then we start playing i'll be there and they go oh you mean these guys did that as well no one seems to realize it's the same band it's yeah because it's such, it's such a different so yeah musically it's different yeah but you, yeah. that that's a, a testament to your talent as a songwriter i've been around a lot of songwriters growing up more uh, my dad's era yeah. standards and um that's a testament to, to you that you, you have two completely diverse songs that touch people in different ways you got people dancing but yeah. and I'm not, i understand what you're saying about a downer but it really is a song that um because that line and, and you probably maybe interpret it a different way i'll always be there people you know my father passed away it was my whole world in 1998 but i always feel and i i do i'm spiritual more than anything that his spirit is here. I feel it at different times. I'm not yeah. saying I see it, but I feel it. Yeah. And that line resonated with me because I do feel that people that, that go on in the physical, that their spirit could still be there. That, that's, I mean, that's how I took it at least. Yeah, and, and I think we all do in one way or another. It depends if you're religious or you're not. Right. There's, look, look up there and look at all... I mean, it's, it's very hard to explain. Science will explain it, but it still doesn't make any sense, does it? So we all have the same feelings, and that's, right. and that's what it's about, really, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Another chestnut I found in my research <laughs> on you is you did in 89, in 89, you did a, a cover of the classic Doors track, 20th Century Fox. We did. And yeah. which appeared, it looked like on the, the Wonder Years music from the Emmy Award winning show in its era. Is that what it was? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Well, the song was, if my notes are correct, the song was produced by the legendary, I know he's passed away, sadly. Doors band member, Ray Manzarek, it was. who was also in the video. Yes. I got to tell you, I watched the video a couple of times. You definitely, you had the long hair. Yeah. I was watching you with the mic. You were, to me, because I, I, Jim Morrison is one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, me too. You were, you were moving around like Jim. It was like you were channeling Jim, because I was watching you on the mic. Maybe that wasn't your intention, or maybe it was. No, it wasn't, but thank you. <laughs> I, no, I, think, I, I think you were channeling him, because I saw... Because <laughs> I watched a lot of clips of, of Jim over the years, and especially yeah. when he would work the mic singing his songs. So it, you you did that cover, a great video, interesting video. You had Ray on there. So my question off of that is, what was it? I can only imagine what was it like working with the legendary oh, Ray? Oh well, it was just. I mean, I'm a big Doors fan as well, and to start with that, I, I love the Doors, and that's. I think it was me who actually said, "Let's do a Doors track." So so Ray was wheeled in by the label to, to produce it. Um, and we said to, to each other, we're like, look, okay, look, he's probably sick of hearing about, it. let's just not talk about the doors. Let's just like get on with the music. Don't hassle a man, you know, guy's a genius, you know, whatever. Just, let's just let him sit there, tell us what he thinks. And so we were going, we were probably about five or six hours in doing it. And he just stood, he just said, guys, and you're going to ask me anything about the doors? <laughs> we just like, so then we started asking him all the questions and everything. And, and one of the moments for me was he, he, we hired a little Farfisa organ for him to play the intro. And I remember sit, sitting in the studio, just him and me. And I just said, go on, Ray, go on, play it. Play, play the intro. To, you know. And so he went, did a little, did a little, did And I was just like, wow, that was just, it was just an honor to hear him play it, you know. Yeah, lovely guy. Absolutely lovely guy. Okay. It looked like around 92, you guys disbanded for a yeah. while. And you and John started uh, a songwriter as a songwriter and record producer duo. Uh, talk about that when you and John kind of moved in a different direction. Yeah, me. I mean, uh, it's, it's long been documented why. I mean, we split up, just so you know, we split up because of financial reasons. We were being ripped off like most bands in the 80s and you know we, we had no way out of it um i wish we'd stuck together now but we didn't um so john and i went off to to do writing and production we did it because we were encouraged to by our publisher because they'd obviously 
they thought they could make some money out of us. And we thought, hey, why not? So we, I was in New York at the time. John was in London. I flew back to London to do it with him. And we, we got involved with a company called First Avenue, who were one of the big pop, one of the big pop companies over here in the 90s. And we just went, walked straight into their stable. They just gave us loads of work. We were writing songs. It was like a production line. We were doing all these pop songs um, and producing them. And it was hard, but God, we learned a lot about making records and making hits because <laughs> we had to. If you don't write a hit, you're out, you know? So it was like, it was like, well, it wasn't, the music wasn't as good, but it's like the old Motown factory. You just come in, you do a song and you're out, next one in. And we, we spent a good few years doing it and it was, it was great. I look back on it now, I think, wow, that was, what a blast, you know? And we did really well, you know? So we, yeah, okay. we enjoyed it, yeah. Okay. About 2004, it looks like you moved to Australia. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you got into A and R artists and, and repertoire work. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah. What happened was, I well, we John and I had been working with a girl called Anita Spring, who was signed to Atlantic Records, and another one called not Atlantic Universal, and another one called Candy Sally, both Australian acts. Um, they had been flying to London to work with us. So, and 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 working with them made me, you know, I needed a vacation. I just thought, you know, let's go down to Australia and absolutely fell in love with the place. And while I was down there, I went to Universal and got speaking to the guys and they were about to do a show called Pop Stars, which was like X Factor bit in the early days. And, and they offered me the gig. They said, well, why don't you come and make the record for that? Um, I ended up on the panel. <laughs> I ended up one of the guys doing the Simon Cowell thing, you know. So I just flew out there. Me and my wife went out, um, set our roots down in Australia, and and I didn't go back. And I got an Australian passport, and I've only just been back in London for the last five years. And I really miss Australia. <laughs> so I'm a dual citizen. So it's okay. how it is at the moment. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting because Nick did that too. Nick was a scout and did something. He told me when we did the interview for a show. Yeah. You had that in common as well. It's funny because when I was working, Nick and I realized we met again. I used to know Nick years and years ago. We used to rehearse next to each other. Hadn't seen him for years. And then when we did it, we did the Lost 80s tour last year. We both bumped into each other. And I was like, you know, what? I know you from elsewhere. I, and we realized that we'd known each other from the business. I'd met him as an A&R man and didn't. <laughs> and because you, because you haven't got your mute, your, your, artist head on we just i just saw this guy called nick you know i didn't realize until afterwards it's the same guy wow. That's <laughs> yeah, cool. man. let's jump to the present day what's your mm -hmm. thank you are you working on an album what's going on now with you yes we're working on a new escape club lockdown album <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so john's john's in in um in australia johnny and i are in london red's in amsterdam so Thanks, thankfully, because of technology, we can we can do it. It's slow, but we've got, we've got some really good songs going. Um, and we're slowly, slowly putting that together. Also, we're doing, um, on Facebook, we're doing reworked versions of some of the older songs, doing a new, new, and we're playing those, we're streaming those of us playing, you know, in the little boxes like everyone lockdown's doing. So, we, you know, and it's good fun. It's harder work than just getting together and doing it, but, but at least we're actually producing something. Something's coming out. So okay. we're doing that, and we've all got our own little projects that we're doing as well. Um, I'm about to start my own podcast with a friend of mine in Australia, so oh, cool. I'm looking forward to that. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> in the Wild Wild West video, John does the reggae part, right? What, the rapping bit? No, ra okay, the rapping, okay. Yeah, the, well, the toasting. Well, the truth is that we got a guy in called Amos Pizzi to do it. Okay. So, so he mimed it, and, and when we do it live, Johnny sings it. John, and Johnny's got it down pat, but the guy that we got to do it, that's what he did. So it was like getting a guest rapper on. So that's Okay, so let me, let me ask you this. In the video, and maybe it was just my eyes, J Johnny back then had very, he had curly hair, but then there was another guy, unless that was him and the video was edited in, had like curly hair, but longer curly hair. That's John, Johnny the bass player. He's, Johnny had dreadlocks, like long dreadlocks, and John, the guitarist, had sort of shorter curly hair. Okay, because so. they have them like when they're doing that part, Kind of yeah. overlap each other, right? They overlapped it. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I yeah. thought it was yeah. different. I, I was yeah. like, yeah, okay. yeah, okay, yeah. Now I saw you on, on. Um, I watched actually yesterday the whole thing. I loved it. Back to the basement. You guys did a thing for COVID. Oh for the yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and 
I, you were uh, with Johnny. Was that in Australia? Were you at that was, no, that was Johnny, the bass player. So that was Johnny who lives in London. The John you're going to talk to is the John in Australia who's the guitar. Okay, okay. Two Johns in one band. It's like, uh, you know, it's hard. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like Duran Duran. Didn't Duran Duran have two, two Johns, I think? Yeah. They, uh, oh, they, uh, they, no, no, Andy uh, and John Taylor. John, Taylor, Taylor. Taylor, Taylor. They both Taylor. Yeah, everybody always got confused because last name. Yeah. So... Whose backyard were you in? Because that looked like it was. It, I, I was in Johnny's backyard, yeah, who lives just up the road in London, yeah. It's wow. lovely, wasn't it? We, we picked yeah. a sun, perfect sunset and everything, yeah. It was, I was, it was perfect. I loved it. It was really, yeah. really cool. Okay. <laughs> with all it, with the fame, and I'm glad that you talked about they ripped you off because I hear those stories a lot and yeah. it's, it's terrible. Um, but to that point of your career with the fame, Wild Wild West hitting, and becoming a, a big hit song. And now we know that, that why you broke up because of the financial, but what would be one thing, I, I kind of think I know the answer now that you said it, but one thing that your fame and fortune, now we know the fortune wasn't what you would think it was, but that you enjoyed, maybe not fortune, but that you liked and then the flip side, what you didn't like. So one on the positive, one on the negative that fame brought you. Are we talking about the past in those days or yes, yes. now? Yeah. In those days, I'll be really honest, I was a young man. The girls were good. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that isn't what I did. Now, if a frying pan comes into the scene, folks, and hit them in the side of the head, that's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I think what I liked about it and didn't use enough, really, was it, it opened doors. And I should have walked through a lot more than I did. Um, it's, uh, which is hard to explain really. So I'm looking at it in retrospect now. I had loads of opportunities that I didn't take. We all, we all must have done. Um, what I didn't like about it is being a product. And, and I think most artists, I mean, it's a very nice problem to have, but it's not, you know, when somebody phones you up, you know, says, right, tomorrow you're going to be doing 40 interviews. Then you're going to be taking, you're flown off here and then you're going to do this and then you're going to do this and you've got half an hour for lunch. Da, 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 da. You go, oh, okay. It, it takes a, it took a while for us to realize that is the life of, of, of a music artist because when you're young and you're growing up you just think oh yeah we're just going to hang out and go and play music and do all that. and it's a rude awakening you suddenly got a proper job um, and i think back in those days that was a shock to all of us and i've spoken to other guys who've been through the same thing they say yeah we didn't realize especially when you get into america and you've got those corporate wheels turning you're in a big company you're just product and you're just out there you know um, and, and it's your job to make the most of it really Okay. That's a long answer. <laughs> no, yeah. no, that's not long. That's, that's yeah, long. yeah. Okay. Let's do this if you would. You, you graciously said that you would do some songs before <laughs> yeah. we get to the second part of the interview, which is just random fun questions. I want to give you the floor to perform. Oh, okay. Well, you've asked me to do two. Okay. Um, now, I've got my guitar, um, and I'm a bit rusty, but I suppose that's everybody's excuse. So... Can you hear that all right? Uh -huh. I'm going to do a little bit of I'll Be There and then I'll give you Wild West. So. Over mountains, over trees, over oceans, over seas. Across the desert, I'll be there In a whisper on the wind On the smile of a new friend Just think of me And I'll be there Don't be afraid, oh my love I'll be watching you from above and I'd give all the world tonight to be with you Cause I'm on your side, I still care I may have died but I come nowhere Just think of me and I'll be there On the edge of a waking dream over rivers, over streams, through wind and rain, I'll be there. 
across the wide and open sky. Thousands of miles I'd fly to be with you. I'll be there. Don't be afraid, oh my love. I'll be watching you from above. I'd give all the world tonight to be with you. Cause I'm on your side, I still care. I may have died, but I come nowhere. Just think of me, I'll be there. Just think of me, I'll be there. There you go. Bit rusty. Oh. <laughs> you know what? Um, I got I to tell you, usually I make my guests get a little emotional if I find something that touches them. You got me this time. So viewers, you're always telling me, <laughs> you got this one emotional. That got me emotional. I wipe uh, no, my, well, what my voice was cracking at the beginning. <laughs> oh, my I, I, I couldn't play that. Well, after my mum died, I couldn't play that for about a year because every time I played it, I just... It all came out. Still does a bit. Anyway, to cheer things up a bit. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> right. Well, this, this is a weird one. Okay. So in Australia, I, I often go around the campfire with my friends down and down south and we, a couple of friends play guitar and, you know, you go through all your songs and everyone always goes to me, yeah, go on, go on, play that, play it. The trouble is with Wild Wild West, it's just not an acoustic song. It's all over drums, isn't it? So imagine a drum beat. Okay. <laughs> Can you sing it in your head? Boom. Boom, 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 boom. 47 dead beats living in a back street, north, east, west, south, all in the same house. Sitting in a back room waiting for the big boom. I'm in a bedroom waiting for my baby. She's so mean, but I don't care. I love her eyes and her wide, wide hair. Dance to the beat that we like best. I'm still looking for a good time living. Amanda's in the back room handing out Valium sheriffs on the airwaves talking to the DJs 47 heartbeats beating like a drum gotta live it up live it up Donnie's got a new gun she's so mean I don't care I love her eyes and her wild wild hair dance to the beat that we like best I'm still looking for a good time living in the wild wild west in the air march them up and down you can live it up live it up all over the town turn to the left turn to the right i don't care as long as she comes tonight she's so mean but i don't care i love her eyes and her wild wild hair dance to the beat we like best i'm still looking for a good time living in the wild wild west the wild wild west the wild wild west old west there you go <laughs> I love it thank you so much you're welcome i love it i love it oh, dear. i didn't do the rap <laughs> that's, that's okay you know what think about it we did we did what they made all the money on back in the 90s on mtv unplugged that's right that's absolutely so. yeah yeah exactly yeah okay Again, thank you. I loved it. I got to wipe my eyes. You still got me. <laughs> <laughs> my viewers are going to say, see, it's, you, you got it turned on you this time. <laughs> I, guess, I, guess I love that song. All right. Like I said, I want to segue into the, the second part of the interview. Just fun, random questions. Whatever you say is the right answer. No wrong answer. Okay. And if you don't think of it, we can come back to it. Because Nick, there was one that said, Nick said, can we come back to that one? So, all right. What is your favorite genre of movies? Oh, it, it changes, but I suppose overwhelmingly, probably, if I'm honest, sci fi. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Do you have a favorite sci fi movie? Well, not movie, but I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd and I love Babylon 5. And I, I watched, I've seen that, the box set, about six times. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
Well, I got I got a classic sci-fi movie for you. Did have you ever seen the 1950s, The Day the Earth Stood Still? I have. The it's original, really not the original. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen the original. Yes, it's brilliant. That's my yeah. favorite. That's my <laughs> yeah, favorite. Okay. O outside of sci-fi, all around, maybe one or two, because people say that's a hard question, but do you have a favorite movie? An actual favorite movie. Um <sighs> If I'm honest about it, Life of Brian. Oh my God. You and Nick gotta be mates because you know Nick loves my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I and I, and I brought yeah. that up, Tri. I brought it up. I said, because you remember the scene when he's on the cross? He said, always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's hilarious. I saw yeah. it. I love Monty Python. Okay. <laughs> Who is your favorite musical band? It's between two, and now th this is now. This is not from the past, and this is for uh, me listening now. Whatever, I mean, yeah. that's fine. I will say the Blue Nile, because I think they're hugely underrated, and they're brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Romantic evening. Young or old, doesn't matter. And you put on music, and I always ask the, the, the singers this. Who do you put on for a romantic evening to listen to? Miles Davis, kind of blue. Okay. Do you have a favorite concert that you've seen over the years that stands out amongst all of them? David Bowie, Serious Moonlight Tour, Milton Keynes. And also, I saw Prince in LA when he had that square stage as well. Mm -hmm. Always. No, I think the Bowie one wins for me. Yeah. Okay. Favorite solo, now these are solo, favorite any era, male singer. I, Frank Sinatra. Yeah, are you doing that because you know he's my favorite singer of all time? He's not, is he really? No, I, 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 I love Frank. I just do. Uh, it's just. Okay. Yeah. Well, do you, can you see, okay, you see where the flag is, right? Behind me? Yes. If you follow over, not the, not the picture that's in blue, but there's one in burgundy, like over here. Can oh, right over. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Can you see Sinatra? Can you tell that Sinatra on the, on the camera with the fedora? Oh, I can. Top left with a hat. Is yes. That, yeah. No, I wouldn't have clocked that. Yeah. Okay. That and, and above it, you can't see it, but that's actually the newspaper from the day he passed away, May 14th, 1998. That's yeah. the newspaper when I lived, I was still in the military in Virginia and I had it put together. Sinatra, okay, we're going to talk a little Frank. Yeah. Now we're going to go off my paper here for a second. <laughs> yeah, okay. you, got my, you got me yeah. excited. Okay, so I, I'm favorite singer of all time is Sinatra for me too. I collect, I have a huge, I inherited from my Uncle Stan who, was, who worked for Frank years ago. Wow. CD collection, and I also have memorabilia of his. So let's talk a little Frank since you well, got you'll me. you'll know more than me. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Favorite Sinatra, one or two tracks. We Small Hours, I think, for me. Oh. Okay, That's I'm going to tell you a story me. about that in a minute, but go ahead. Um, oh. I haven't got, I couldn't say another one. I love them all. It, okay. It's just, the thing with, for me with Frank is his voice is so behind the beat and so the way he delivers the words. He can sing anything. He could sing Three Blind Mice and I'd love it. Yeah. <laughs> really, quite okay. honestly. It's interesting, he said, in wee small hours, my Uncle Stan was a music guy, and then he went, he was a song plugger, and then he opened up, a, um, he was a, a song publisher. Yeah. He, believe it or not, I don't know if you remember the album cover of We Small Hours of the Morning, that was his design that he brought to them when he worked, because he worked for Frank's publishing company, and he got, and they, they used it, and he got, a, and this is in the 1950s, I was like, he got a whopping $50 Bonus. No. Coming up with that cover. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, that's, yeah. Oh, that shows you, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mad. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Sinatra performance? No, because I've never, I never, oh, I, oh, you mean from watching? Yeah, clips or shows. Or um, no, not really. No, I can't say, no, I can't say I have particularly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you like the acting side of Sinatra? Not as much, to be honest, okay. no. Not okay. as much. I've got to be honest. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, 
which Sinatra era because he basically reinvented himself 40s, 50s. I mean, the 50s is, is probably his greatest period, but... Oh, I, would, I was going to say the 50s because that, to me, that was before pop and rock music came along. So for me, that, that time, like the, the early, yeah, in the 50s and just, just, all that, just pre-Beatnik and all that, I love that era of music and, and I love the stuff he was doing then. And that's like a, why I listen to Miles Davis and Chet Baker and people like that as well, because I just love that period, of, that romantic period of music, you know? Okay, and I would assume as a musician, you know, he worked with Nelson Riddle and those, those, those big, I've got you under my skin, those big arrangements. Yeah, man. yeah. I'm sure that you appreciate them like I do. Well, and also, because like everybody else, I've gone back to vinyl, right? Because we've right. all done it. And I've got um, songs for young lovers on, on, over there on my deck. And you listen to it compared to modern productions and being a record producer as I am, I realized that that's an orchestra with Frank sitting there singing or standing there singing in front of an orchestra and it sounds just perfect mm -hmm. and it and you put it up against any modern record and it and it wipes the floor with it because it's so perfectly recorded and beautiful anyway so so just out of curiosity with you being from england uh and liking that era of music do you like who they called the english sinatra matt monroe yes really do i really like matt monroe yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. yeah yeah he's very good okay <laughs> uh flip the question who is your favorite female singer? I'm going to be a bit, a bit, a bit strange. Kate Bush. Okay. I, I, maybe probably she's not the best singer, but I love her lyrics and I love everything about her. It's your so, choice. Yeah. That's, no, yeah. that's no wrong or right answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Being a singer, do you have a song that comes to you a lot in a shower or driving and to, in your head and you're humming it or you're singing it, whether it's one of your songs or another song? that you just love from forever. Is there a song? Love My Way by the Psychedelic Furs. I love okay. that song. Okay. I love that song. Okay. It doesn't take much to persuade me to sing it. <laughs> I just love it. It's one of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you a car person? Do you like cars? Yeah, I do like cars. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a complete petrol head, but I do like cars. Yeah. Okay. Particular, it's, it's more of a male question, but do you have a favorite car? Even if you didn't own it. Oh, an Aston Martin do be seven. I, I can't afford one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Isn't that what James Bond had? Didn't he have an Aston? Yeah, one? yeah, okay. yeah, Aston, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite noise or sound? Rain on a, rain on a um, corrugated iron roof in Australia. Okay. Now flip that. What is your least favorite noise or sound? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've got a lot of them. <laughs> um, God, I can't. Oh. I really hate to say this. I hate the sound of kids crying. Okay. Which is an awful thing to say, and I'll probably get loads of haters for that. But some really, something about the frequency, and they're designed to do that, aren't they? Kids are designed for you to notice them. Yeah. And so when they do, I really notice it for some reason. Yeah. It drives okay. me nuts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all right, though. Um, favorite food? Oh, that changes all the time. Um, oh, God. What's my favorite food? I, I'd say ge generally, I would say Italian food is my favorite. If Can I say that, or would you like an actual dish? <laughs> no, Italian food is fine. That's what Jack said. Jack, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Italian food. Yeah, Italian. Okay. If you were to hit the lottery, tomorrow for the two three four hundred million the big one what would be the first thing you'd do i would buy a plane ticket and go back to australia okay you, you probably never heard about the story about frank in australia did you no oh he no. got in trouble in melbourne in 70, <laughs> 74 73 the reporters were chasing him i mean like paparazzi out the ass just he couldn't breathe and, <laughs> and you know frank didn't pull no punches so he called him basically pimps and whores, you know? Yeah. And they basically ran him out the country. So his plane was on the tarmac at the airport. So the unions wouldn't fuel up his plane because it was his private plane. So the guy, the, the, I forget what, I don't know if it was the prime minister or, had it, or maybe it was the head of the labor union or whatever, had to intervene. So they fuel up his plane to get him the hell out of there. And then years later, they forgave him and he came back 
in like the 90s and he did a tour and they loved him again. But the, uh, Australia, they had a love and hate yeah. thing for Sinatra. <laughs> Your um, pre-COVID favorite vacation destination? Oh, we've been to a lot. Um, oh God, that's, that's, you're firing these ones at me and I get, I've been to so many. Um, Greece, Greek islands. Okay. If you could meet one person from any time in history, dead or alive, doesn't matter, who would you like to meet and what would your first question be for them? Ooh, um, I'm aware I'm giving you dead air here. <laughs> you can think about it. Um, I would probably, I'd like to meet David Bowie. Truthfully. Okay. okay. And my question was, would be, it would be, it would be please, would you teach me how to write songs? Okay. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> but you know what? You're, you're humble. I appreciate that. But you're a pretty damn good songwriter in your own well, right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you. I don't just, and I always tell my guests, I don't say anything I don't mean. Because right. if I didn't mean it, I wouldn't interview because I'd be like, I'm not interested in interview. I don't care for your music. You know, but you're a heck of a songwriter in your own right. With everything we discussed career wise, food wise, David Bowie wise, if you had to sum yourself up, Trevor, in one or two sentences as a human being, what would you say? I'd like to say, I, I, what would I like to say? I'd like to say that I, I care. Um, and I'm here for a reason. I've yet to work that one out myself, but music's part of it. Oh, that's so hard to, it's really hard to say that, isn't it? It's like a very soul searching thing to say. Um, I hope I'm kind and I hope I, bring something to people. I, I don't know. I can't, I find that really hard to say. I bet everyone does, don't they? Uh, some people struggle with it, so, but you yeah. know, what? but a lot of people say, musicians say, I'm, uh, I was put here to do what I do because I do feel that. Yeah. Because yeah, you bring so much happiness yeah. to the world with your music. I mean, it's, that's yeah. when we transition, whatever your beliefs are, your music's always going to be here. You talked about Sinatra. He's been yeah. gone for 22 years now, it's and we're still fun. talking about him. Yeah, of course you are. I mean, I think the hard thing is for us, like you're talking to 80s guys and, and every, as gen, every generation goes, it, it, it kind of doesn't get taken away from you, but it's not there all the time anymore. You have to get a proper job or you have to do this or do that. And, and that's the hard thing to deal with is that you're getting older and you, that's not all you have to do anymore. You have to do other stuff as well. <laughs> and when you're younger, can you completely devote your life to it, you know? Okay. Yeah. With all the interviews, and you said earlier that was a tough part at the beginning because you weren't used to it, but with all the interviews you've done over the years, from the beginning to current day, is there one question that an interviewer never asked you and you said to yourself, I wish I was asked that question, and if there is, what's the answer? question I wish to have been answered. No. Oh God, that's a really hard one. Um, no, I can't think of one. I've been asked everything. Okay. <laughs> I've been asked everything. I really have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And finally, do you have a saying you live your life by? believe okay Hold and on. i really do I, I believe that in anything you do it's it, i think it's like the matrix if you believe enough it will happen okay uh, if you would for the viewers uh put out your social media platforms where they can find your stuff no i'm saying what are, what are your social media platforms Oh, sorry. I, I, I don't miss you. Um, we, our main one, to be honest, is Facebook, because I think people of our age tend to go there more. And I've got my own personal Twitter, and, and we've just started doing Instagram, but that's the main three. But, uh,
Oh, no, obviously, we've got our own YouTube channel with all the videos on it and everything. But Facebook, if you're going to come and see us, come and see us on Facebook because we, we're on there all the time talking to people. Okay, and that, if I remember correctly, that's under the Escape Club on Facebook. That's the Escape Club, yeah. yeah. And okay. if you want to talk to me, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> okay, yep. I actually followed you on Twitter. Okay. Oh, good. I'll follow you back, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, final message. I want you to, your, you got the floor and the mic. To your fans from the beginning to present day, what do you want to say to your fans? Well, I'd like to say thank you at first, obviously, for sticking with us and, and for all the people who come and see us at the gigs that we've been doing recently, like the Lost 80s, and hopefully we'll be doing more. Come and say hello to us because we really appreciate it. We like talking to you and, and being part of the, the Escape Club, really. That's, that's what it's about. It's all joining it together now. Now we're all getting older. <laughs> that's the way to go. Okay. Well, hey, Trevor, I greatly appreciate you coming on. Like I said, the viewers are going to mess with me now because usually it's reversed. I make the, the interview be a little <laughs> emotional. You got me when I'll be there. But, yes, <laughs> oh, good. but I, I'm glad because the song resonates with me. I, thank you for your time. Like I, as you said, you mentioned I'm going to be uh, interviewing uh, John all the way in Australia who can really yeah. give me the lottery numbers because he's like 12 hours or whatever. Oh, yeah, he's way ahead, man. Way ahead. Because yeah. you mentioned Australia interviewed, um, and I think he might have been on a tour with you, uh, David Sterry from Real Life. Have you worked? Oh with yeah, him? yeah. Met him a lot. Yeah, yeah he's, he's over there in Australia. Lovely guy. Yeah. Very, very. I, yeah. I, again, like I said, I appreciate you coming on. As you have projects coming out, let me know. I have you oh, back on the show again. Definitely. And, uh, be safe. And uh, best best to you. And, and we're getting close to the new year. So going into the new year, hopefully, we finally get past this and we can get back to some normalcy. And and thank you for using your your platform to speak out. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the interview. Good. Take care. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, folks, that's another Bad Brad Berkwood show when they can't forget about it. The man, Trevor Steer, the lead singer of the Escape Club, another great artist from the 1980s. Yeah, I got touched that time by him singing I'll Be There. Those lyrics, they got to me. They got to me when I was doing my research. What a song. That is my number one favorite song. 1B, Wow Wow West. Come on, forget about it. You know they're great songs. All right, that's what you get on the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. Guests like that, compassionate, humble man. Can't say enough great things. Another enjoyable interview. All right, again, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Leave your comments below. Let's have a conversation. All right, and remember, folks, remember, happy Thanksgiving. I forgot to say that in my opening. Happy Thanksgiving around the world to people that do celebrate it. May you be safe. Wear your mask, put your mask on, social distance, and use your common sense. If you think God gave it to you, great. If you don't believe, still use your common sense. Let's get past this COVID. Let's get over it. All right. And remember, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad. Brad. Out.